Well, we've been going about on our travels, you know, we've met a lot of craftsmen of all sorts, you know, wallpapers, plasterers, lead men, everything, you know, stonemasons. It's really good to know that there's still craftsmen and crafts ladies around who, when given the right amount of time, are still capable of doing work at just as good a quality as what they did in the olden days. Fred served his apprenticeship as a joiner, and he always had a great appreciation for the skills of the carpenters, woodcarvers and stonemasons who built Britain's great castles, cathedrals and country houses. This love of fine craftsmanship led us to a greater appreciation of the skills of the craftsmen of the past and of the work of craftsmen and women today who carry on the traditions. At junior school, as a small boy, I, 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 I was always top of the class in, in woodwork. I don't even think they have woodwork lessons now at schools, you know, it's a bit sad that really. But nevertheless, when I became 15 years old, I started to serve my time as, as a joiner. And I stuck to it till I was 21 years old, which meant I was a fully time served joiner. And, and I got my city and gills at night school and all of that. And of course, I've always had a great interest in wooden structures of any sort, you know, like ships and buildings, and, and especially like the period in, in Tudor times when they built really the biggest wooden structures that were ever knocked up in a way. Here behind me, this is Little Morton Hall in Cheshire, which is a, a, a fine example of Tudor woodwork and heavy carpentry. They, they, they basically set off with a, with a plinth of stone or brick and then made these frames that, that weren't very big. They only did like one story at once uh, and, and stuck them up on the edge of the stonework and then interlaced them with all sorts of bracing pieces, as you can see. And then, of course, they, they, they infilled it all with lath and plaster and that's where, you know, this famous half-timbered building saying come from. One of the things that makes Little Morton stand out is the fact that there's all this lovely stuff in between the, the framing, you know, which of course is all made of wood. The beautiful four-leaf clovers are called quatrefoils, and of course they're sawn out of one solid lump of wood, you know, to that shape. In the olden days, it would it would designated that it, the more fancy what you had on your half-timbered house, the richer you were, you know, so the Mortons must have been quite well to do. The man who did the job, Richard Dale, you know, left his mark behind here, here on this window frame, you know, it says, Richard Dale, carpenter, made this window by the grace of God. It's like an early bit of advertising for window frame making. Considering the amount of acreage of land that the, the Mortons owned, they mustn't have been short of a few oak trees when they started building this place, you know. Now, how many sort of workmen Mr. Dale had is, is you know, another matter. I don't really know, but I know some of that when they were boring all these hundreds of holes for, for the pegs that hold the wall thing together, when they hit a knot, there'd have been a lot of head scratching and swearing. It wouldn't have been very pleasant at all, having done a bit of old boring in fairly hard wood. But I should imagine that the timber would arrive here still in the round and would be split with iron wedges and then cleaned up with an adze. Uh, and, and then the mortises and the tenons worked on the ends of each piece. Yeah, I suppose that when, when the framing were more or less completed, the men would move in to fill in all the voids with the wattle and daub, you know, uh, you know make, it, make it sort of weatherproof in a way. 
I think sometimes it's very easy to think that handcraft skills are no longer necessary in the 21st century. But Fred shows us that these are still living crafts. When he takes us, say, to the Globe Theatre and shows us the timber frame construction and talks to the, the men and women who are involved in building this place from scratch, he shows us that there are, there are ways of building, ways of ornamenting our lives that perhaps we should reconsider and use more often. It is a timber frame structure. Uh, and we know that the, certainly the Globe and, and the other theatres were, were timber frame structures, is, is the way that the timber framing was done. I mean, mm. this is something that we've really, perhaps in the last 15 or 20 years, really come to understand mm. through reconstructing them at open-air museums. Mm. And there what one does is one carefully dismantles an old building. You then do archaeological uh, mm. analysis of the, the joints mm. and the tool marks and the mm. techniques. That really gives you a chance to look oh, inside yeah, yeah, yeah. the joints mm. and see, you know, mm. see exactly I mean, mm. how, they, how they drilled out the joints. Fred's passion uh, for everything old because it was craftsman made. It was handmade. It wasn't made by a machine or anything. It was actually a man's hands which had made the items. And so everything which was handmade, Fred had an interest for because it, ha it had been actually made. Fred always enjoyed meeting craftsmen like Peter McCurdy, who built the timber frame for the reconstruction of Shakespeare's Globe. And for his next series, he went to visit his workshop in Berkshire, where they were making a new crook beam roof for a barn near Glastonbury. So, you see, these are the... These are the main collars, and these yeah. are the, the upper upper cruck, mm -hmm. uh, second tier of uh, um, crucks. And then we've got, in, in between them, we've got these intermediate uh, yeah. principles, which have also got a little collar. The, these are the arcade plates, mm -hmm. which, of course, run the whole length yeah. of the building. Now we're, we're just marking in these purlins, yeah. ones that run along this way, and we're also marking in all these, these small curved wind braces. Mm. And how long so will it be before it's finished? <laughs> we're going to start putting this up on site in about 10 days time mm. and uh, we're going to be working through till probably beginning of February with the frame mm. and the tiles will go on. Before the snow comes. Mm. Well we hope it will wait until, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wait until March for that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the real problem today is that we have a government and all they want to do is put people into university. They don't realise that to be a good skilled worker you need a high level of intelligence. So we should be going back to the time when we only had 15, 20% of our intelligent people going into universities. The rest of them should be going into practic doing practical work, going through technical colleges, going through craft apprenticeships, and realising that the skilled worker, you really have to be highly intelligent to do a skilled job. Of course, they make, I mean, you find all sorts of different sizes of pegs, mm. depending on the size of timber. Mm. and the size of joints. I mean, here we've got a little one from the top mm. of a pair of rafters, mm. and then um, here we've got a much, much bigger one. Mm. And th this is the sort of size of pegs we're going to be using on the, mm. the barn here from Pilton. Yeah. Oh. And, and even, even bigger, <coughs> in fact, than mm. that. Bigger diameter. Bigger, oh, big, yeah. Certainly bigger diameter, mm. yeah. yeah. So we, we, we could have a look and see how the pegs are made, if you like, mm. here. Mm. Might even get you to make one, Fred. Oh, I'll have a go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we, we start off by... Mm -hmm. by splitting them out of the log to split out the individual squares mm. we use a tool like this which is called a fro mm. it's I've not never a, seen one of them before well it's not a, it's it's not really an edge tool it doesn't no. cut the timber no it just, actually, it's just splitting effect splitting yeah. it apart mm. that's right mm. um, once we've split out uh, a square mm -hmm. or a rough square which yeah. which we know mm. is uh, at one yeah. end at least it's the it's correct it's the correct yeah, size. size for the finished that's article. right mm -hmm. um, then we then we use this uh, little shaving horse it's called mm -hmm. and a draw knife well, whittle it down that's to right yeah, yeah. size would you like to have a go yeah, yeah? I, I, I know that i know you want a octagonal shape and not round right i'll be all right <laughs> <laughs> right mm. hey. mm -hmm. it's a bit bent isn't it for starters um some aspects of, of Fred and, and the fact he, he was a sort of a, a craftsman uh, in many ways. I mean, I'd, I'd call a craftsman someone who sort of just naturally has a feel for the things that he works with. <laughs> Nearer. In, in that respect, he was 
a little out of his time, but also at the forefront, that I think we're now changing uh, and more and more people are you know, giving up their sort of office jobs and wanting to go back to the sort of craft techniques that Fred used because he just gets so much more out of them. They're, they're so much more satisfying uh, in terms of what the end result is. So it's nothing better than actually seeing something at, finished at the end of the day rather than a piece of paper that you pass on to someone else. Now then, John. There's no roofs like this where I come from, and they're no. all made of slate. Right, yeah. What really stops the rain coming in, you know, because I've been inside and there's no underbelt, is there? No, no, no. Mm. It's really just the angle, the way the straw's yeah, laying yeah, on the roof. Yeah, yeah, When you're actually up here amongst it, you can see why, you know, yeah. it'll hit every individual straw yeah, before it gets anywhere near through it, won't that's it? Right. Well, we, then... got, we got a thickness on here about two foot. Yeah. So yeah, we've got yeah. an undercoat, yeah. we've got a top coat, so... Yeah. Um, even if it goes through this top coat, it'll still yeah. come out on the end. And what stops it all slurring off like? What? Well, it's all sparred onto the base coat with hazel spars. Yeah. They're pushed in through into the base coat. Yeah. And really, it's the angle of the roof, the angle of the straws mm -hmm. that the water just drips off each and one. And what keeps the other on, the, like the base coat, you know? The, the base coat, that's, that's tied to the rafters, and then we, yeah. then we spar on top of that. Right up at the ridge. Yep. There's that lovely crisscross design. Is that yeah. designed to like keep it together at the top? Well, at, at the very top, we just yeah. we just bend the straw over the top yeah. to keep it yeah. waterproof, and that's the simplest sort of ridge mm. that it would have had hundreds of years ago that we're mm -hmm. doing on there. It's not yeah, ornamental. Because you see someone with a, like a double thickness yeah, right. at the top. I yeah, see, that's very top. ornamental, but that wouldn't yeah. have been like that 150 no, years ago. No, so no, we, no. We're trying to keep it yeah. sort of plain and simple. Yeah, yeah. As like, it would have been. I mean, they were doing this in Roman times, weren't they? That's right. You know, before that, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Almost the same, eh? Yeah, down yeah. back to the Iron Age, really. Yeah, yeah. And I've they noticed were fashioned around uh, like that. At the far end, it's gone all like darker colour, hasn't it? Yeah. We, it? Well, we've been here three months, mm. so I mean, obviously the first stuff we've put on is now yeah. quite dark. Yeah, it's like dyes. It will darken down in six yeah. months. This will mm. be quite a dark colour. Mm. We've got the sun mm. and the rain. And like, do all the all the like bits that are blowing about now? They, do they? So they break up and blow away. They will do in time. That's yeah. how the actual roof wears. I mean, yeah. we'll lose about a quarter of an inch of that every year. Yeah. And that's what gives the roof its life, really. Yeah. Or well, that's yeah. what takes away. Yeah. Well, that's what gives yeah. it its lifespan. Yeah. yeah, so what it's. Uh... How, how, how thin has it got to have got down to before? Well, it's got about, about six inches to come off before it yeah. gets down to the fixings, and that's yeah. really the life of the roof. Yeah, and then you've got to do it again. Yeah, so I mean, long yeah. straw like this will probably last 15 years. Yeah. It's the shortest yeah, last. It, it seems to me as though you could take this top layer off and, and still use the stuff underneath. Would you that could. Be? Yeah. The next time this is thatched, what will happen is we'll just take this top layer off, yeah. and then we thatch over the, well, take the bottom part out and thatch over the top again, probably take about five or six inches of this old stuff yeah, off then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it'll be old then, it's not old. Yeah. He just enjoyed craftsmanship of any standard, of any type. Uh, as long as it was really good, uh, he could appreciate the work that had gone into it. Are you going, let me have a go? Yeah. <laughs> have I'm going to have, have a do with this. All right. All right. All right. All right. Wait a minute, I'll do it. Sir. I'll do it proper. How's that? <laughs> No, then, we're here. <laughs> well, here we go. The then. first move. Please, just take a double handful off of there. A double handful? Yeah. That that That's plenty, yeah. About that much. Yeah. I mean, I'm only an apprentice, so I don't want too much. Right, what do we do next? I know well, you've got to lay it on there. Yeah. That's yeah. it, then. Yeah. Just spread it out. Spread it out, what, like that? That's it. And then we take a little take a little bond of straw. Yeah. And if you take some of those spars on your left there, keep one of those like a staple. That's and it. Pump it in again. Yep. How's that? It's all right. <laughs> Looking good, isn't it? <laughs> That'll keep more out for another hundred yeah. years, won't it? Yeah. Where did it come from, this stuff? Is well, it... this has all come from Poland, actually. Yeah. 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 I wonder why. Why? Uh... Well, the reason is we don't have the old varieties of yeah. straw in England yeah. Yeah. and yeah. to the length that this has grown. This yeah. is a rye straw which grows yeah. very long. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, um, How many Thatchers are there left now in England? You know, too many, too many. Yeah. About 50. <laughs> yeah, that's what, when somebody says to me about steeplejacking, that's where. How many steeplejacking? You must be the only one. Yeah. <laughs> and bloody hundreds of them, yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's about 1,500 on Yeah, there. yeah. So there's yeah, quite a lot, really. Oh, aye, there's a yeah. fair bit of stiff competition, eh? Yeah, yeah. otherwise. Yeah, I've noticed them wetting it down there, um, like uh, before they wind it all up into bundles. Uh, yeah, the idea of that is yeah. so that it packs together tighter yeah. and it doesn't slip about so much. And, mm. and when it's dry, it's very slippery. Yeah. It's very yeah. waxy, yeah. as you can see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you have yeah. to keep it damp to Bit keep like it nice it, and tight. It's a good job, isn't it? That's it, yeah, the old grill <laughs> cream, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there the, the can't be many thatch roofs as big as this. It's, it's almost like a cathedral, isn't it? Yeah, it's I mean, it's, it's an old tithe barn, which... Yeah. Um, there's not that many tithe barns, no. mate, but not no, as big no. as this, certainly. No, I've never seen a patch roof this big before. One of the places that um, I most remember going to on location and, and realising just how much skill Fred had and he could turn his hand to anything yeah, was when we went to yes, the Welsh yeah. Slate Mining Museum in, in North Wales. And the, the boys there, the gang of men that was working there and had done for many years, had make it look so easy the way they cleave the slate. And I thought to myself, well, Fred's not going to be able to do this, although, as ever, he's enthusiastic about doing yeah. what he's going to do next. And he sat down and he took yeah. the piece of iron yeah, and chop, chop, chop. And, yeah, chop. Yeah, and I think everybody there, it's fair to say, were amazed that he'd managed to do that because, according to, to one of the men, I think the apprenticeship was something like about five years or something like that before you were allowed to do that. And Fred had just done it. And it was like watching a little bit of magic. In fact, one of the programmes where his joyous look on his face because he's actually, wow, I can do this. It's fabulous. It's very good. We get another load by dinner time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be lucky if we done six. <laughs> I think Fred will have opened the eyes of lots of people to the the joy of craftsmanship and to the small scale perfection that people put into into things. Um, the fact that they're not just making things work; they're making things work well, and they're making things look good as they do their jobs. And looking good was certainly one of the main criteria in the design of the House of Dunn near Montrose. The great glory of the interior of the House of Dunn is this magnificent saloon with its wonderful plastering, which was done by a man called Joseph Enser. And believe it or not, for all this magnificent ornamentation, he only got 216 quid, you know. It sounds unbelievable, isn't it? That weren't just for plastering this one single room, it was for doing the wall house. When we go into a place like the House of Dunn, it's not always easy to understand how it was constructed, how it was made. But he takes it apart bit by bit. He looks at details like the ornamental plaster work. He shows us how craftsmen and craftswomen contributed each in their own way to creating a masterpiece. Most people coming into a room like this would have little idea as to how they went about doing it, you know. But going back to my days at art school, they had an ornamental plastering class where you know, everything nearly were made on the benches and then screwed and wired in secret ways to the walls and then touched up afterwards. I mean, in here there's a lot, quite a lot of interesting stuff, you know, like up there there's a, a, a basket. And rumour has it that they actually used a real basket and dipped it in, like, liquid plaster and then, of course, carefully fitted it to wall, you know, there's... There's a violin that's reputed to be real, you know, underneath the layer of plaster. And then up there, there's seashells that are, you know, I mean, they're, they're too perfect to have been, you know, all made, as you might say. But the wall lot is, is, you know, been made on benches and then stuck to the wall. The main thing we've got to do with everything is preparation mm. before mm -hmm. we mix the plaster. Mm. Not everything's ready. Oh, the yeah. plaster will set on us. Mm -hmm. So uh, this will be some Hessian scrim. We're going to reinforce the panels mm -hmm. of this stratwick ceiling. Mm -hmm. If we pre-cut it, it will save some time. Yeah. Have some wooden lasts, which yeah. we'll prepare as well. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, reinforced bars. That's it. Mm -hmm. If we need to screw it to the ceiling, it acts as a washer. Mm -hmm. So if you'd like to uh, just prepare yours, the same. Yeah. We just, these will just snap quite easy. Mm. Can I do that? Yeah. Well. Mm. Carry on. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very rarely today that we, we can make anything better than we could 
in the past. We can make it faster, mm -hmm. we can make it cheaper, but it's rare that we can actually make anything better than we could have done you know, 100, 150, 200 years ago. Mm. Mm. Oh, the lumps are disappearing now, aren't they? Just pour mm. a small amount that we're going to brush in. Yeah. Lovely. That's it. Right. Put the plaster down. Mm. Ah. Right, if we just brush this all over. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Not like that. That looks wonderful. And using our Turk's head brushes. Yeah. For one for you. Mm -hmm. We'll actually uh, splash. Yeah. Just, just get a nice liberal yeah. large plaster. Yeah. And then we actually splash Ooh. into the mould to get a yeah, good thickness. And it also. Uh, this is a bit messy, this, isn't it? Oh, it's a lovely <laughs> messy job. <laughs> mm. Right. Right, with the skin, just lay this over the top. Mm -hmm. Lovely. <coughs> That's it. Pile that yeah. on the back. Give it. Yeah. Make sure all the last and the, it's all rubbed down below the surface. Yeah. So that'll uh, <coughs> when we come to strike off. Yeah, it's not. Uh... That's looking. It should be okay. You can then just strike off over the top. I can see you've used plaster before. Oh, concrete! <laughs> Twenty years ago, uh, apprenticeship started to die. The, uh, the gold standard is to get A-levels and go to university. We no longer value um, journeymen tradesmen who, who, who used to spend five years learning, learning, learning their trade to make things. We're seeing somewhat of a resurgence of that um, over the last um, five years or so um, through the government's uh, modern apprenticeship programme. Uh, and I think Fred was very keen to support those sort of things for, for people who would rather work with their hands um, oh, than necessarily follow a higher education. I thought you noticed a rather nice ceiling rose on the way in. So yeah. I thought we'd, uh, yeah. thought we'd that, make some leaves. Like this is the rose. Yeah. Mm. I thought yeah, we'd make some is... leaves to mm. go on it. So again, with this, if mm. we just pour a generous amount in, mm. that should be fine. Mm. This then, just push it down on the top. Mm. Starting from the back. Mm. Pushing down, mm -hmm. and any of the excess plaster can just spill out, mm -hmm. come out the holes on the top. Mm -hmm. be fine. Just give it a good, generous push. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Right. We'll come back in ten minutes yeah. and see what mm -hmm. they look like. The craft skills are, are something which is always under threat. We have a real shortage of them in the nation at the moment, and we need more craftspeople who can get out there and help restore the buildings. Otherwise, the cost of restoration shoots through the roof through the shortage of craftspeople. And so Fred was very useful in showing these people were out there that they were working hard to preserve our heritage and how essential they are towards keeping it as a living heritage. No, so our leaves are doing. Yeah. <laughs> mm. That's it. Yeah. This is the flying bend the, uh, Yeah, bend, bend it looking back. Yeah. And that should help release the uh, Yeah. Help release the leaf. Mm. So if we can pull these out. Yeah. There we go. Oh, oh, that's and a then better. this is a, this yeah. is just the flash. Yeah, it's it's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. A small feather. Yeah, yeah. Stick it to our base. Yeah. Mm. And we have a mm. one yeah. of the leaves of our rose. Mm. Yeah, very nice. Sometimes it's hard to know exactly how a thing is made. It can be appear to us so simple because it works so beautifully. But what Fred does is he really takes it apart for us and shows us how much skill goes in to each element, say, of, a, of plaster work or um, a stone carving. When he goes to York Minster and he talks to the stonemasons there, these are things that it's really very difficult to see from the ground, but they are incredibly complex and very beautiful objects. And it's the stonemasons who have worked hard over many years to have the best bits of the past and also be reworking it so that it's, it's there for the future. Well, Fred, now we're in the carver's shop. Mm, very nice indeed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we've got to have Martin here carving yeah. one of the arch stones mm -hmm. for the southwest doorway. 
Mm. Um, the stone's been masoned in the, in the masonry shop, as yeah, you saw, gosh, all, the geometric yeah. work. Mm. And now you can see areas of the stone which have yeah. been left for the foliage. Yeah, the that's, that's quite beautiful, that leaf with all, all of the out up back in it. Eh? Yes, it's a... Uh, yeah. Shall we go round the, work. round the corner and have a word with Martin? Now then, good afternoon, Martin. Hello, <laughs> How are you? Yeah, I can see now the, the three stages are making them beautiful leaves that are on this side. Um, yeah, it must take a long time. How long does it take you to do, like, three leaves? Well, it's probably about another week's yeah, work work left in there. There. It's yeah, probably a couple yeah. of weeks in, in our... Yeah, home. when people walk by York Minster, they don't appreciate all mm. that great effort. Mm. Yeah, how do you go about making these hollowed out by, you know, a heck of a tricky operation with such delicacy, isn't it, really? Well, I suppose once the leaf's established... Yeah, yeah, well, right, see, right see the, the, uh, a, a bit nearer than what that one is like. Yeah, you, yeah. See, you see the form, you can mm -hmm. actually begin to drill through behind and yeah. actually pierce mm. through yeah. with, with mm. smaller chisels. Yeah, 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 aye. I mean, when you finish one of them, just getting it up there, you know, like the thought of damaging it must mm. be terrific. I'd be scared stiff for taking it out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no. you need a little knock, don't you? And a big lump off corner. And uh, well, Once it goes out of here, we forget about oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you start on the next block. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've always wished I could do something of that nature myself. You can always have a go. There you go. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, really. <laughs> I'm better on big lumps. Right. You know, they let me have a go on a big lump next door. Uh, I'm OK on big lumps. Well, I think the fact that there has been this rise in interest in conservation means that there are people around. I think we had a very... The craftsman had a very narrow brush with extinction, if you like, because there was a time when no-one could see any point in doing anything by hand. But just in time, as people did get more interested in conserving buildings, there was enough interest and still enough people left who could teach, because that's the other thing about craftsmanship. It is traditional and it's very difficult to pass it on once it's died out. But there are now schools of stonemasons, letter cutters, hand printers, not very many, but enough to keep it going. How long have we actually been doing it? I've been doing it about 15 years mm. now. Mm. I've been actually at the Minster 10 yeah. years. When you first started, did you drop any clangers? Mm. It's very, very <laughs> difficult at first, yeah, very, yeah. very hard. Yeah, it's, uh, did you ever get disillusioned with your efforts, you know, like sort of... I still do. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know, to me that looks as good as how Michelangelo ever did uh, on the, you know, on the, them leaves when they're finished um, and all. It's like, I've got a better idea now, we're looking at how you form that and then this one's partially done mm. and then the pencil marks on just that radius yeah. were, you know, the obvious next thing is to... You know, uh, you've already done the, the groove there, haven't you? Is to make that nice raised bit, but, you know, get to the right depth in. Mm. What crowds me is how do you get all these bits all the exactly the same, which you, you have done uh, very well. Well, from, anyway. from the cast, yeah. we actually take a slab of clay actually onto the building and take an mm. impression yeah. of the old stonework, bring mm -hmm. it down here, make a plaster yeah. cast. Mm. And then with calipers, you can actually transfer yeah, the measurements onto yeah, the stone. Like, yeah, across the width from mm. sort of one extremity to the other of that. You do with a pair of calipers, then you know exactly where you're yeah. going. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The spacing's all important as mm. well. Mm. Mm. This is the top, of course, isn't it? And that's the bottom, and uh, that's the curve of the arch that's that right, it fits yeah. in. Yeah. So that'll go on the left-hand side of the arch. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, when people wander about out there, they don't realise that just one stone took so long. Yeah, no wonder it took them 250 years. Yeah, it's just very labour intensive. Yeah, yeah, men must have started and died, eh? Well, you know, without doing hotels. Eh? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to depress you, right? But keep going anyway. <laughs>